Good morning and uh, welcome to our webinar, Net Zero Carbon Plans, How to Get Started and Who Can Help. My name is Rob Wall. I'm an Assistant Director here at the British Property Federation, the BPF. I'm sure you know the BPF provides a voice for UK real estate across all different asset classes and across the UK. I lead our work on sustainability and I'll be chairing the webinar this morning. And I'm pleased to say that I won't be doing it alone. I'm joined by a, a great panel this morning. Uh, and let me go through our panelists and introduce them. So first of all, uh, let me welcome Adam, Adam Baranowski. Adam is Climate Change Programme Lead at the Better Buildings Partnership, the BBP. Um, BBP is a collaboration of property owners who work together to improve the sustainability of, of commercial buildings. So welcome, Adam. Uh, also pleased to be joined today by Andrew Griffith from Planet Mark. I'm sure many of you will know Planet Mark is a sustainability consultancy, also a certification um, and net zero provider who work for organisations and for the built environment. So welcome, Andrew. Also really pleased to be joined today by Ariane Frame. Ariane is sustainability manager at Workspace, Workspace Group. Um, Workspace is a provider of flexible working space and owns, I think, around what five and a half million square foot of, uh, of space across London and the South East and provide a base for four and a half thousand businesses. So welcome, Ariane. Also welcome Sophie, Sophie Goddard. Uh, Sophie is Director of Sustainability at Canary Wharf Group. Uh, many of you will know Canary Wharf. It's the largest urban regeneration project in, uh, in Europe and owns, develops, manages around 9 million square foot of office and retail space. Uh, and also owns um, many apartments. So welcome, Sophie. Um, and last but certainly not least, let me welcome Stuart. Stuart Mee from uh, Landsec. Stuart, Stuart is the Sustainability, sustainability Director at, uh, at Landsec. Um, Landsec is, is one of the biggest real estate uh, companies in Europe with a mixed portfolio of around, I think, what, 25 million square foot of space covering retail, leisure, workspace, um, and residential. So welcome to our, our stellar panel. But now just turning to the substance of this webinar. So last year, the BPF launched our BPF Net Zero Pledge, which aims to help all BPF members in the transition to net zero carbon, and also to help the wider property sector in the transition to net zero. And as part of that initiative, uh, we want to ensure that all members, all BPF members, have started on that journey to net zero. And we're also really keen to share insights and experiences from those businesses that are already on the journey. And today's webinar really is, is part of that offer. It's, it's part of that programme of work um, to members and to the wider sector. Specifically, uh, the webinar is about um, getting started with net zero targets and plans but it will also uh, allow us to share insights and experiences. And I'm really pleased to say that um, Canary Wharf Group, Workspace, Landsec have all taken our BPF Net Zero Pledge, and they're all given their time today as, as in line with that commitment to share insights and experience, you know, part of that radical collaboration piece that we hear so much about. Um, but that's enough for me. Um, we've set the scene. Uh, so let's now open up and bring in our speakers. And I wonder, Adam, if I can start with you and maybe we can uh, start at the beginning. So we're talking about net zero targets and plans. But why? Why do we need net zero targets and plans? Mm, thanks, Rob. That's great to, to be here. I think it's a it's a really important question. I mean, the, the climate science is is well understood, so I won't go into that here. But I think from our speaking with our members, our 50 or so members we see kind of two main drivers here the kind of motivation and incentives for this the first is around regulation so the uk has a legally binding commitment to net zero carbon emissions the government are constructing a, a regulatory patchwork to deliver that so in the uk we've got um, transition plan requirements tcfd reporting uh, for example and then at the european level we've got sustainable financial disclosure regulations the eu taxonomy emerging and we could see further regulation in both UK and Europe. So 
there's really only one direction of travel and having a proactive approach through net zero carbon targeting and planning helps to avoid the penalties that might come from that regulation and, and to stay ahead of those requirements before they really start to bite. And I think the second uh, kind of motivation or driver is around the market, so the business and the investment conditions. And I think the way that you, you've worded that question, targets and plans, is quite important because I think historically having targets on their own was enough to satisfy investors, shareholders, financiers. But nowadays they're much more savvy and they understand where a target is not um, augmented with clear delivery plans, uh, which are important because this transition to net zero doesn't involve incremental tweaks or kind of well-meaning words. It's about investment, rebuilding investment processes. It's just a different way of working. Um, this is all quite kind of risk focused and cost focused. There are, in a property context, uh, we're starting to see um, the recognition and handling of net zero transition aligning with value. Uh, tenants are increasingly prioritizing sustainability and environmental performance. So having those targets and plans can help to retain those tenants who, who value that and commit to their needs. I think also lenders and financiers are, are starting to offer improved terms to businesses who can link their, their finance to outcomes related to decarbonisation and sustainability. So I think it's those kind of two areas of the kind of push factor of regulation and the pull factor of the markets that are kind of, I suppose, motivating our members to start to create their plans and their targets. Thanks, Adam. So you know, you make a compelling case, the regulatory case, you know, the market case, and obviously you reference the the sort of climate crisis. So the case is clear, but actually, how do you get started, Andrew? I wonder if I could bring you in at, at this point. You know, if you accept the need for targets and plans, how do you get started? What's the first thing you need to do? Yeah, so I guess, you know, there's, there's sort of two levels to sort of think about here. You've got sort of what you're doing at sort of the corporate level as an entity, as a company yourself. And then there's what you're doing at the property level. Um, and when you're looking at the property level, there's another two sort of subsections, which is looking at embodied emissions associated with the construction of the building. And then the ongoing operational emissions, which is sort of predominantly going to be your energy use and things like that from heating and power in the building. So... But that's sort of what we're talking about here. And broadly, you know, how to get started is the same for both. It's really kind of like what Adam just said around the importance of targets and the importance of plans where, you know, fundamentally, you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, you can't progress towards something you haven't set a target for. And if you don't have a plan, it probably won't happen. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, you know, just think about it in, in sort of very simple terms. Imagine your CFO coming to you and saying, hey, I need you to save money, cut money in the budget, but I don't want you to measure anything. I don't want you to set any targets. I just want you to come up with a list of things that you think will save us money and we'll give that to our investors and they'll be incredibly happy with us. No, like they would laugh you out the room because you don't know whether it worked. You don't know, you don't know what the return on investment was. You don't know whether um, you know one thing worked better than another, all of those different things. And so really, you know, measurement is the is the first point because you've got to understand where you're coming from. Then you sort of look around setting some realistic, ambitious, but credible targets. And then you come up with a plan for how you're going to deliver that. So one like really sort of fun example within a property context, our, our COO uh, worked at, within sort of a large hotels group and has this uh, example of the, the, the most expensive bacon sandwich ever. And uh, basically they 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 started doing this journey. And so they started measuring and they put in place measurement, which then allowed them, they suddenly found that there was one particular kitchen, one particular hotel that was using tons of energy between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m., even though they weren't serving. And uh, they went and had a chat with the chef and he said, well, um, in order for him to not have, to, you know, they had to turn on the equipment 15 minutes early. And so to get an extra 15 minutes in bed, this chef had had a deal with the security guard to turn on all the equipment before, like when he was doing his rounds. And in return, he would give the security guard a free bacon sandwich every day. This bacon sandwich was costing the company £20,000 per year, five years ago. <laughs> so it's probably like a hundred grand bacon sandwich at this point. So it's just, you know, you've got to measure, measuring tells you where your, where your opportunities are and where your risks are. 
then you've got to set some targets. And that's what they did for this chef and all the rest of their kitchens. They set targets around saying, we need you to reduce your energy consumption. And then they came up with a plan on how that was going to work and what that looked like. So that would be, that would be my uh, sort of recommendations on the start point. So I wasn't expecting to talk about baking sandwiches, but good example. You never do. <laughs> um, but no, a good example of how you need to measure and then set credible targets and have a plan in place for achieving that. And that makes sense theoretically, but actually it's, it's quite difficult to do in practice. Um, and we know many of our members are looking for help and support in how they get started. Adam, I wonder if I can, can come back to, to you. I know at BPP you run um, the Climate Commitment, which provides a framework to help commercial uh, real estate companies on that, on that process or on that journey. Perhaps you could tell us a bit more about that and how it works. Yeah, happy to do that, Rob. So um, in 2019, we launched the Climate Commitment, and this is a pledge for um, commercial property companies that requires signatories to publish their net zero carbon pathways and their delivery plans, as well as their um, disclosing their energy performance of their assets and uh, to develop what we call comprehensive climate resilience strategies. Um, we're really pleased that the, the Climate Commitment is one of the qualifying initiatives for the BPF uh, Climate Pledge. And really, it has the objective of delivering net zero buildings by 2050, incorporating direct and indirect emissions, operational and embodied carbon, and scope one, two, and three. So this makes it one of the most kind of wide reaching, ambitious commitments that, that property owners can adopt. We've got 37 signatories now, uh, representing more than 400 billion in assets under management. But what we're really keen to do with the commitment is to make sure that we equip signatories with the tools and the resources to actually deliver. So we've produced a number of resources. The best one, I think, um, to reference here is the Net Zero Carbon Pathway Framework. And this is a document which provides guidance on what does net zero mean at a kind of corporate level, fund level and an asset level and what sources of carbon should be within scope as a minimum. Um, and how to structure and report your net zero delivery plans in a way that's timely and, and useful to stakeholders. And we support that with a programme of work within the BBP to explore some of the sort of technical challenges that that can bring up. So what's the role of offsetting, renewables, um, energy intensity targets, but also the kind of practical changes that this means to a business. So how do investment, acquisition, property management, disposal, uh, processes need to be reconfigured to deliver net zero and how do the people who do those jobs need to be incentivized and trained and upskilled in order to do that because this is an unfamiliar game for a lot of people who work in investment and property context so it's really important that we don't just give them a, a load of acronyms confusing terms we actually show them this is how to apply this in your day-to-day -day job and this is how and why it's beneficial for you to do this um, the commitment's open to all commercial real estate um, owners and on the website for the, the, the commitment, you'll find all of the pathways for all 37 businesses have been published. Um, so that's really important for us, kind of transparency and openness of the initiative, as well as the updates, annual updates that all of uh, many of our signatories have published since then. So um, we've been really pleased with the impact that it's had. And as I say, it's great to be a sort of qualifying initiative for the BPF pledge. Thanks, Adam. And, and perhaps we can come back to this during the course of the webinar. I know we have colleagues on the call who are signed up to the climate commitment. So maybe we'll we'll put you to the test later on and explore uh, how it's working. Um, but there's a range of sort of frameworks and initiatives that, that can support members. And I think alongside the BBP climate commitment, the one we hear about the most is probably the UN Race to Zero and the UN Race to Zero partners and projects that can initiatives that can help members. Andrew, I know Planet Mark um, is a Race to Zero partner, um, but actually what is what is Race to Zero and how can how can working with Race to Zero or Race to Zero partner help our members really turbocharge that transition to net zero carbon? Yeah, of course. So um, Race to Zero, for those who aren't aware, is a, it's a United Nations backed campaign. It's the, the largest global alliance of organisations who have set credible net zero targets. Um, broadly, there are sort of five tenants to the to the, to the race zero. There's the five P's, we call them, which is pledge, plan, proceed, publish, persuade. So 
pledge. You've got to make a commitment to achieve net zero as soon as possible before 2050, with a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030. Then you've got to come up with a plan on how to achieve that um, within 12 months of making your commitment. So you can make your commitment today. Within 12 months of today, you have to then have a plan on how you're going to achieve, particularly those shorter term targets. Then you've got to proceed. You have to take immediate meaningful action within the first year to start reducing your carbon emissions. Fourth is publish. Um, and similar to sort of the uh, BBP, uh, sort of climate commitment, you're looking at, you know, needing to report on, in the public domain on an annual basis, your progress against your targets, what you're actually doing. And then the fifth one is persuade, which is basically committing to align any policy and lobbying efforts with your net zero targets um, and not um, you know, sort of doing anything that undermines sort of that, that global movement. And fundamentally, it's all about net zero governance, right? Like, you know, who here has, uh, you know, a profitability strategy for 2050? No one, like, it just, it's just <laughs> you know, no one, you don't plan that far ahead. It's crazy. So why are you confident that your business is going to be a viable entity in 2050? And I would imagine your answer to the question would be because of the governance structures and frameworks that we have in place on much shorter term basis, on an annual basis, five year basis, three year basis, whatever it might be. Those governance structures are what give me confidence that we are going to be a viable long term uh, sort of entity. And it's the same thing for net zero. So really uh, the race to zero and, and what we're doing at Planet Mark is all about helping organizations set up this net zero governance framework so that they get their systems in place so that it becomes a much more straightforward process of not trying to you know, solution 2040 to 2050, but actually looking at, okay, how do we know if we're on track and if, if we're, we're aligned with this longer term trajectory of being a viable entity in 2050? So that's that's what it's all about, and it's it's free to join uh, the race to zero, um, and and as Rob says, we're one of around ten global official partners of the race to zero, who you can make uh, your commitments with. So yeah, very happy to work with people um, and answer any questions people have on that. And Andrew, does that work for businesses of all types and all sizes? So obviously we represent real estate, but even within our membership, we have real estate law firms and consultancies and architects, etc. So is there a route and a pathway for all types of business, big and small? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's open to all businesses. I think at this moment, there's probably, I think there's around over 12,000 companies around the world who have who have made uh, a race to zero commitment. Um, so yeah, it's op open to all. And so it's something which you can really get your supply chains involved in as well, which obviously the supply chain engagement piece is really critical um, and, and sort of start really helping to drive this sort of movement towards it because you know the truth of it is that this is a race and there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers <laughs> in the race to zero but most critically of all it's a race that we will all win we will all lose together and so it's very much in our interest to try and bring people with us so encouraging our customers encouraging our suppliers encouraging our teams to sort of really get behind this this movement to net zero is is really critical uh, and something that all the businesses who are tuning in today can definitely play a part in. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and thanks, Adam. And we've heard a bit there about, about the case for net zero carbon targets and plans, you know, why it's important, how you get started, who can help. Um, but we're keen to shift from the, the theory to the practice. And great to have a couple of BPF members here who have started that journey, who have net zero targets and plans in place and to hear from them. And I wonder, Ariane, if I could perhaps turn to you first. We're really interested to hear, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about workspace and uh, your approach to setting targets and plans. Right. Um, so yes, the workspace group, as you were mentioning at the beginning, Rob, we are a flexible office uh, provider. So we've got over, um, we've got about 60 offices in central London and another uh, 14 or so in the home counties. Um, with, you know, our typical customers are SMEs from a really wide range of industries, from architects to fashion designers. You've got charities, recruitment agencies, consultancies, so really a wide range of, of, of tenants uh, who we call customers. Um, and, you know, our motivation for setting net zero carbon targets, you know, is pretty much what um, Adam was mentioning before. Um, but I would add, so obviously our investors are an important part of the uh, regulatory landscape um, is also key. 
um, and obviously our customers. Uh, and I will say that, you know, we've seen um, through um, surveys of um, SMEs, especially the ones in London, uh, that there is an appetite to um, occupy an office space where the landlord is really committed to sustainability. Um, and of the people that we um, surveyed, 60% um, um, of those SMEs had themselves net zero carbon targets. So you can see why they would want their landlord to have them as well. Um, and for 20% of them, it's a deal breaker, you know, if the landlord doesn't have a robust sustainability strategy. So obviously we didn't wait for the results to set net zero carbon targets, but it really it reinforces, you know, why we're doing this as well. Um, and so a little bit about our uh, strategy. So we, um, our signatories to the BBP climate uh, commitment. Uh, we published on that zero carbon pathway in January 2021, and our target is to deliver a net zero carbon portfolio by 2030. Um, so you've got um, four pillars within our strategy. Um, I'll do this very briefly. So 42% reduction in scope one emissions, 20% reduction in um, embodied carbon per square foot of NLA, and to continue procuring 100% of renewable electricity with an aim to um, always increasing our own um, solar panel um, electricity generation on our sites. Um, so that's a little bit about, um, about our plans. Um, as some of you may know, we acquired a company called Mackay Securities um, last year. So this means that we'll have to reset um, our science-based targets that underpin our net zero carbon pathway. Um, so something to look forward to for myself. Um, and yeah, so we're keeping a really close eye on the consultation on the um, uh, building uh, science-based target setting guidance um, and tool. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's where we are right now um, with our net zero carbon strategy. Thanks, Ariane. And I think you make a good point that even once you have your targets and plans in place, it's a constantly evolving piece. And if you're a a landlord or a property owner because your assets will, will change over time. Um, I mean, you mentioned there the uh, BBP climate commitment. So you're signed up to that. How, how do you find that? How, how is that helping you, you know, progress your, your targets and plans and your ambitions? Um, yes, yeah, so I think we can give credit to the BBP climate uh, commitment for, you know, giving this first push to a lot of companies, including Workspace, to really, you know, set their net zero carbon targets. Um, as Andrew was saying, if you don't have targets and you don't have a plan, nothing's going to happen. So I think, you know, that's the, one of the big uh, achievements of um, the BBP climate commitment. Um, it also provided a robust framework. I feel like we were a lot of these companies, um, including uh, Workspace, you know, it's their first time say, setting those net zero carbon targets. And it was really good to do this as a group. Um, and, you know, the BBP had um, also task forces to actually, you know, um, build uh, the guidance around the zero carbon pathways uh, for the climate commitments. Um, and, you know, having clear emission boundaries, investment boundaries, deadlines for publishing your net your first net zero carbon pathway in an ongoing framework um also was very important um and to adam's point um for us it's not only about you know setting those targets but also about the delivery when the we first published our targets and you know the the, the framework guidance was published that was one really good thing done but then i think what the bbp was really helping everyone doing is just sharing ideas um, and getting on those, you know, quarterly meetings around net zero carbon and sharing our challenges and successes, I think it's been a, a really great learning experience for all of us. Um, and yes, the main quality, I think, of the commitment itself is around transparency um, and accountability. So for us, it's really allowed us to go through a really robust process of science-based target setting. And also it's been a great tool to engage with various stakeholders to obviously our customers are very happy to hear about our net zero carbon targets, but also in terms of um, engaging with internal stakeholders um, that are key to delivering the strategy has been very powerful because once you've you know, publicly committed to achieving this, then you know, um, we all need to work towards the same goal together. Um, and I think we're very lucky at Workspace that we're vertically integrated. So we've got facilities team, our Workspace employees, and also development teams so that's been very instrumental in, you know, 
getting everyone on board from an embodied carbon perspective and also um, from uh, operational energy performance um, perspective. So I'll give one example. Now we have monthly energy performance meeting with all our um, FM teams, um, which you know didn't necessarily happen before we had a net zero carbon commitment. Um, and we look at you know the high um, the poor energy performers and we, you know look at really prioritizing those. And it really helps that now um, each of our facilities manager have energy performance targets in their annual KPIs. I think that's a big change that I think was driven by the, the, the climate commitment. And just on one of our flagship assets, you know, we looked at it, very high energy consumption. All we needed to do is some tweaks to the schedules, isolating boilers and chillers. Um, and we managed to reduce um, uh, gas consumption by 34% without any CapEx investment and reduce our energy use intensity in that building by 11% in one year. Uh, bearing in mind that's from comparing to 21, where there was not many people in the, um, in the office. So I think that's quite an achievement. And I think this is really being enabled by our commitment um, to net zero. Um, and I feel like a lot of people now in the company um, are on board. Thanks. I think a lot of really useful takeaways there, one around how you embed it within the business. I think there's a risk sometimes that all us sustainability geeks talk to one another, but actually the whole business needs to engage. And also around the sharing and learning from one another uh, through the commitment is really interesting. And certainly something we could be better of, uh, we could do better as a sector. Um, just a reminder to, to those who have dialed in, so please do use the Q&A button to ask um, questions, make them as difficult as you want. I will be filling them out, so it doesn't bother me. Um, Sophie, I wonder if I can, can turn to you now. So uh, we've heard, heard a bit about workspaces approach to setting targets and plans. Perhaps you could share a little bit about Canary Wharf Group, about your approach and, and, and how you work. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. So I think I'm just going to touch slightly more broadly on the environmental side for a moment, which is that what we've done at Canary Wharf Group is essentially taken a step back and really looked at our business to define where are the areas where because of the way we're set up, because of what we do, we can have the greatest impact. From that assessment, we've highlighted three key environmental areas which we focus on. So we focus on creating a space here at Canary Wharf for nature, as well as for people. So at the moment, we're transforming our public realm and we're looking at biodiversity, not only within the constraints of buildings, but across the estate as a whole. We're also looking at trying to transition to a circular economy. So moving away from that linear approach of we just want to do this to actually, if we want to do that, what's all of the impacts that we're going to have because of the fact we decided to do it before we take the action to deliver. That is a huge focus area and a focus, I think, that we will see gather momentum. But coming back to the focus of this call is we have an ambition to transition to net zero. And I love that reference earlier to we will all win or we will all lose. And we certainly feel like we really have to try and play our part here to do what we can to transition to a net zero economy. In terms of what that means here, and I was listening to, I thought perhaps because we're focused on that more kind of earlier stage of net zero, it might be worth me just flagging some of the steps that have been absolutely key for us. And to be honest, listening into what the other speakers have shared so far, there's kind of clear alignment in the approaches. But, you know, to really, really simplify, I think the first thing or the first of the five kind of main steps is setting those ambitions, really saying, what are our company going to commit to? And let's set that ambition. Let's hold ourselves to account to it. And that should be at a corporate level, but also a project level as well. The second key step, and it's not that you do one and then the other, you can do them concurrently, but it's to understand your emissions. And that is a big task to really understand, do you have the right data? Are you tracking where those emissions come from? And then the third is ensuring those emissions are properly captured. So looking at the reporting platforms you have, looking at the way in which you collect data, looking at the accuracy of that data. You know, I'm sat today in one Canada Square. You know, we have a system that's plugged into this building to help it be the most efficient it can be. We're talking over 85,000 data points have to be exactly on track for this building to operate as efficiently as it can. So this is a huge, huge task. But we have to make sure that the emissions are captured. We've got the right platform. And and that we're setting targets specifically for those. 
The fourth is really about turning that into reality in your business. So it's great saying, do you know what? I'd love it if we just stopped using fossil fuels absolutely everywhere. And if we could just get emissions to zero, but that really doesn't mean anything. So it's actually engaging with every single part of your business to really understand, okay, how and what does this particular part of the business need to do to transition towards net zero? And the fifth really comes back to, and it's a number of people have mentioned it today, but that reporting, that transparency, that continually assessing what you're doing, this space is rapidly growing. Even organisations with big sustainability teams are having to constantly monitor the market, constantly share to help create the solutions that we need. So let's kind of not be afraid of that kind of continual development and let's be transparent, let's learn and let's develop as we go. So hopefully that provides a little bit of an insight into what we're doing. Definitely. Thanks, Sophie. And, and you're right to sort of plant net zero within that wider sustainability context because it's all interlinked. I mean, you mentioned targets and mm. um, Ariane mentioned science-based targets. I know at Canary Wolf Group, you use science-based yeah. targets as, as part of your strategy. Can you just explain what science-based targets are and why you've chosen to adopt that approach when it comes to net zero carbon? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially, a science based target initiative is a number of different organizations who have joined together, including likes of CDP, it's UN backed, um, WWF as well. There's a number of organizations who've joined together. What science based target to is they help drive climate action by helping organizations to set targets. Now, what we find really, really, and I can't speak more highly of how science-based targets have helped support what we do, is that they don't just say, yeah, you know, there's your target, done, off you go. You know, to set a science-based target, you have to collect data internally, you have to share that data, and then you have to agree targets specifically with them and their knowledge of climate science. Those targets, the minutes, the first step with a science-based target is to commit to set a science-based target. I think it's two years you have to then go ahead and set the target off the back of it. But it's also completely transparent. The minute you commit, it goes onto their website. The minute you set that target, it goes onto that website. So in terms of that ownership, holding yourself to account and taking action, having that organisation there who is reviewing that data when you submit the target, and we know that our targets are published, really helps enable us to continually drive our action. We monitor our progress against them, and we can use that mechanism to actually help drive action within our business so that we can make sure that the emissions data, the data that we're collecting as part of this science-based target is driving in the right direction. Fantastic. Thanks, Sophie. Um, Stuart, you've been very patient. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, really keen to hear hear from Landsec, you know, hear your insights and experience. I mean, in terms of your approach for setting targets and plans, how have you gone about it? So where are you on that journey? Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, like uh, like Canary Wolf Group, um, we also have ambitious science-based targets, um, which have uh, evolved over time. Um, we've committed to achieving net zero by 2040. Um, and have extended our targets to cover uh, our scope three emissions now um, for our development supply chain and our customers. And that's to align with the net zero standard. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we got started really. Um, and I think initially we recognize that in order to achieve the ambitious targets that we've set, um, it's, as has already been mentioned, clearly important to have a robust plan that sets out how we intend to do that. Um, otherwise, all likelihood is it, it wouldn't be achieved. Uh, and ultimately, this is how we formed our £135 million net zero transition investment plan. Um, and really, I guess a key part of doing that uh, involved bringing the right people together. Um, so our operations teams, our finance teams, and ensuring that actions are built into asset level plans as well as at a, at a, at a corporate level. So the approach that we took, I guess, initially, it was really important to understand, understand and understand and undertake that portfolio analysis um, to understand factors such as energy intensity for each asset. So that really kind of then allowed us to prioritize uh, and help determine where we should best focus our efforts. We ascertained that uh, actions needed to be implemented, or sorry, we, we then ascertained where actions needed to be implemented uh, 
and worked with various consultants to help us determine the best technology that we could use to, to, to do that. Uh, so this included, for example, um, retrofitting air source heat pumps across some of our office buildings. Um, we landed on air source heat pumps due to the uh, level of maturity of the technology, uh, installing solar panels across uh, our retail sites, um, so looking at where that could be increased, looking at making sure that our building management systems are truly optimised, so developing a schedule there, uh, looking at LED lighting upgrades was, was another big factor, but also bringing in innovation, so something that we're, we're currently um, testing in our head office is uh, a trial of artificial intelligence uh, to look at making sure that heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems are uh, continually optimised for the building. Um, the other big area that we're focused in on is around uh, customer engagement and as a result have developed a customer engagement programme. So in, in bringing all that together, um, we really needed to understand what the potential costs were where that funding might come from as well. So what, what routes, for, for example, through um, service charge and so on, uh, but also the returns that uh, that we might expect to get from those. Um, and again, not by no means kind of a, a, an easy feat. Um, and some of the challenges that we experienced really in terms of um, determining what those expected savings might be and some of the sensitivities around that. Um, I guess the key thing there, though, ultimately is a, is a forecast and it's something that will change um, over time, uh, I think the important thing really is, is, is making a start. Other things that we thought about and, and clearly uh, is around um, things like in installing the air source heat pumps has got the potential to be quite disruptive to our tenants and so making sure that that is um, really planned in considering the way that we, we do that. Um, I think getting help along the way has been, been key as well. Um, so we've worked with different businesses businesses who specialize in each area of our, our plan, um, for example, in terms of undertaking uh, feasibility studies for um, the installation of air source heat pumps and solar panels. Um, and I think the final one to note as well is, and I think it's already been picked up on as well, really, is that having robust data is really important. And that's helped us to both um, inform the decisions that we take, but also to confirm if the actions that we're implementing are delivering the improvements that we'd expect them to. Thanks, Stuart. And we, we might come back to the AI point. So I see there's a question already been asked on that. But before we do, I wonder if I could pick up on uh, your comments around working with customers. I think we know that particularly for property owners, working with occupiers, tenants is really critical to achieving those net zero ambitions. Um, how have you approached that? So can you give us some examples of what you're doing at Landsec to, to build those relationships? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, collaboration is crucial um, and customers, you know, it's important that they play a central role in reducing energy use and cutting emissions, um, particularly as they often account for around, or account, can account for over 50% of the building's total energy use. Uh, so it's important that they're aware uh, and drive initiatives to reduce consumption. So that could be whether it's through technology, whether it's procedural, um, but also um, behavioural initiative, initiatives, which in many ways can be can be low cost and, and quick wins. Um, so really to, to, to address that, we developed our customer engagement programme um, to engage with customers and, and also empower them on how to reduce energy consumption. Uh, again, we, we, we looked at where the biggest wins would be. So we identified our 35 highest consuming customers and carried out energy audits with them to then make recommendations as to actions that they could implement to reduce consumption and, and also cost in turn. Um, so, so far we've completed 25 audits with our customers, um, which so that overall um, accounts for about 19% of our energy use across our office portfolio. Um, and the audits that we've undertaken have typically identified potential savings of between 15 and 20%. Um, one of the challenges that we have is obviously once those um, potential savings have been identified is making sure that they're then ideally um, implemented. Uh, some of the examples coming out of the, the audits are things like uh, installing power bars to automatically switch off small electrical equipment. So that's something that we're looking at how we can do that across our portfolio. Um, 
I guess we've also then arranged workshops with our customers so that between customers they can share ideas on what's worked and what hasn't. Um, but also it's important to understand why. Uh, and then also comparing performance. Um, I think one of the other things that, um, again, for, for us is increasingly um, important is using that data to know how our customers use their spaces so that we can predict conditions ahead of time. Um, so something that we've just started, um, again, at our head office, is trialing zonal, zonal working on Fridays, uh, where occupancy is now far lower um, than the rest of the week. So identifying what can be put in place there, um, and, as, and in turn, um, tracking any savings that, uh, that are seen as a result. Sounds good. Thanks, Stuart. And, and thanks, everybody, for the, you know, for the uh, initial comments there. I'm keen to sort of see if we can whisk through some questions. If there are any more questions, do please post them in the q and I see we've got questions coming in, which is great. Um, there's a question around offsetting, which I think is probably a good one to pick up on. I wonder, Andrew or Adam, whether you can give us the principle around how offsetting should feature within targets and plans. And then maybe we can hear from one of our property owners about how offsetting features within their real world plans. Andrew. Yeah, sure. Um, so you know, offsetting is, is an important tool, but it's important to set it in the context of what part of the challenge, I guess, it, it represents. So in direct answer to the question around, you know, should the focus be in, on investing in reducing emissions? Yes, <laughs> uh, is the short answer to the question. So with science-based targets, particularly at, at your sort of corporate level, the balance is that you'd be looking to achieve a 90% carbon emissions reduction from your baseline and up to 10% of what we call sort of unavoidable residual emissions is what you can use uh, carbon removal offsets against to sort of counterbalance sort of unavoidable emissions. So <laughs> offsetting is an important tool, but at a corporate level, it's 10% of the tool. And 90% and of your focus and 90% of your investment should be upon uh, investing in reductions, not least because the more that you reduce, the less you have to rely on offsetting. So if once you've sort of as, uh, you know, assigned all of your CapEx um, sort of planning, plans and spending, et cetera, you have additional budget, by all means over-invest in, in offsetting, looking at carbon neutrality and things like that, but, but the focus should very much be on achieving reductions, um, I would say. And that, that's going to be borne out, I suspect in the, and Adam can speak to this as well, um, in the UK net zero carbon building standard which should be published by the end of the year. Um, and again, there will be a balance of expectations to reduce the emissions associated with you know, the construction and operations of buildings. Um, and, and a big emphasis will be placed on achieving those reductions. And then there will be a role for offsetting to play as well. But yeah, focus on reducing first and foremost. Thanks, Andrew. Adam, did you want to sort of add anything to that? Yeah, I would agree with everything Andrew's just said. I mean, one of the key principles of our climate commitment is the concept of the mitigation hierarchy, which if you haven't seen it before, is effectively a sort of upside down triangle, uh, which at the top has the kind of key priority measures, energy efficiency, on-site renewable generation. And as you kind of go down this tapering triangle offsetting kind of sits at the bottom. So I think I would agree with Andrew's answer around you know the priority being improving the energy performance of buildings, not least because we're expecting regulation to start to focus on the energy side of the, the equation. And if I suppose if you create a strategy that's built on offsetting, you're not really addressing the fundamental carbon risks that sit with your business, which will, will still remain there. You're basically creating a sort of cost in perpetuity to deal with those emissions if you want to deliver the net part of net zero. But from a business value point of view, you're not addressing the underlying carbon risks and liabilities, which might still be a problem to your investors, your financiers, your lenders, uh, your your tenants, uh, for instance. So it's it's um, it's probably not not really driving as much value for your business as it, as it could be. And that makes sense. Sophie, I wonder if, if you might want to pick up on this. So I mean, the theory is absolutely clear, but in practice, how easy is it yeah. to, to follow that approach? Well, firstly, I think they've summarised it absolutely perfect. I think the focus, and we certainly think here, the focus is on creating the reductions in the first place. I think we also, the only thing I would add is just that we have a responsibility to drive the market to say this matters. 
and we need solutions to come to light, to market, to light, so that we can actually transition to net zero. So I think it's really important that the focus be on challenging the hardest parts of your business. You know, like when I referenced earlier, when we look at our missions, we look at the ones that are hardest to affect first. So we've done a huge piece on our scope three emissions where we've actually been offering, we had a launch event in February and we've been offering free training to our supply chain to help educate them on what a science-based target is and also to give the market knowledge on why it might be beneficial for them. So, you know, we understand that actually us and many other developers have science-based targets, which require them to work with, to procure from other companies who have science-based targets. So this is something lots of people are monitoring. At the same time, getting a science-based target is far easier as a small company as an SME and it's also far cheaper so we're trying to share information from the market that helps drive these companies to see that actually this transition to net zero should be a business priority it can actually help grow and sustain your business if you do it Um, and actually offsetting yes there is a role that it will play but it should definitely be below the tough hard challenging your business identifying the efforts that you need to make to create those reductions in the first place. Thanks Sophie. There's also a question around AI tech, and I wonder if I could put this to Stuart and Ariane. So I think you both mentioned tech and AI, AI, AI in your in your sort of um, introductions. Stuart, so what role do you think AI and tech can play in helping to cut emissions? Um, yeah, and I think AI is, you know, it's, it's something that we're trialing at the moment. Um, and if it proves to be successful, it's something that we would look to roll out across our portfolio ultimately. Um, obviously, it's very much so in the early stages, but I think I think it's I think it's important that we we trial these things to make to see whether it does work and then be able to kind of help bring it to market as well. Um, as I say, what, what we're seeing is it's really kind of helping us to, to optimize our our heating and ventilation um, in, in our buildings. Um, and it kind of is obviously using real-time information um, based on things like oh, various factors such as occupancy, weather conditions, and, 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 and so on. So um yeah, I think it has, I think it will play an important role um, ultimately. I think one of the challenges that we we do face with it is obviously there's lots of different factors that go into how a building's performing. So it's 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 being able to isolate that and say, well, actually, as a result of having the AI in place, this is these are the reductions that um, have been achieved. But um, but yeah, I think going forwards, absolutely, it will have an important role. And the workspace, Ariane. So I know you're using tech to understand your building's performance and to cut emissions. So how is, yeah. how is that working? I think yeah, less than AI, more tech for us for now. Um, but yes, I think um, I mean first of all, before even thinking about tech reducing it, helping us to reduce emission, it really helps us uh, getting accurate data. So, you know, um, so if you mentioned, this is really key, just understanding your baseline performance, understanding, you know, the, the, the energy performance trends in your buildings, uh, preferably in real time. That's These are all things that can really be um, facilitated by the right techs with um, automatic meters, smart building management systems that make everyone's lives easier, including the facilities management teams. Um, Because I think I can speak for a lot of people in the room. We sometimes spend an equal amount of time looking at data or trying to get data or analyzing it than actually implementing um, the upgrades or um, optimization initiatives on the ground so I think you know if you can automate that it really helps you um it really helps your bottom line which is you know um getting to net zero carbon so um and then yes obviously we we have um we also roll out systems that actually help us reduce our energy consumptions with um rolling out a smart energy management system and now it's uh, covering about half of our portfolio and it's yielding um really good results um, so yes, so I think it is an integral part of how we are going to all get there collectively, and it's always good to keep an eye out on what's the latest um, offer out there as well. Thanks, Arian. I mean, you mentioned there the latest offer. So, it's one question that's that's come in is around uh, sort of the direction of travel. So, you know, we've spoken about how to get started, but actually what's next, what's coming around the corner? What do we need to be aware of when setting and trying to deliver net zero uh, targets and plans? Again, Adam, 
Andrew, I wonder if I could sort of put this question to you. So, you know, what's next? What do we need to be aware of in terms of regulation or, or legislation in this space, Adam? Yeah, I think there's there's quite a few things. I think the, the probably just if I could pick one or two um, that I suppose I'm most interested in. The, for me, one of them would be the transition plan task force, um, which has uh, has put out one or two pieces of guidance for consultation and essentially the, the transition plan ta task force is looking to I suppose set out how companies um, should should you know have they want to create basically a gold standard for setting out how climate transition plans should be framed and reported by um, by companies um, and I suppose I think over the next two years the the FCA the Financial Conduct Authority is going to be kind of looking at how to strengthen disclosure rules for listed companies and, and financial firms, which would cover quite a lot of the property space um, on, on transition. And I think that's going to be quite an interesting initiative, sort of supra, I suppose it's going to cover a lot of the things that already exist around net zero pathways, uh, TCFD reporting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not quite clear right now how that kind of fits into um, the sort of, uh, uh, the property space yet but we're, we'll be watching that with interest and the other one that i should obviously mention as as andrew's already referenced is the net zero carbon building standard which uh we're pleased to be part of the team developing um huge radical collaboration hundreds and hundreds of experts from across the property space representing 14 different types of building um looking to develop the uk's first standard for what a net zero carbon building is and in future, creating a verification rules for how that will be be measured. So, um, it's a really interesting project. If you haven't come across it already, I, I strongly encourage you to to have a look at the website, which I'm sure we can circulate. I'll, I'll put it in the chat in a second. We've got a um, a consultation being published um, late May, early July to sort of uh, update the market on what we've achieved in the first year of that project. Um, really encourage people on this call to have a look at that and engage with our consultation. So, I think those two are the big ones for me. Adam. Yeah, I, I definitely echo um, what Adam said uh, on both the Transition Plan Task Force and uh, yeah, the UK Net Zero Carbon Building Standard, which um, yeah, the Planet Mark team are involved in as well. And it's, it's coming along really well. And I'm really excited because it's going to be world leading, I think, when it when it comes out. There isn't really a, 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 a particularly strong established framework for what a net zero carbon building is. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to address that with this with this standard. The one that I'll add into the mix is uh, minimum energy efficiency standards. I think they're going to play a really big um, driver within the UK market in particular. So for those who aren't familiar, so it's looking at EPC ratings of both new, but, but yeah, both commercial property and also residential. But looking at commercial specifically, um, you know, the, the EPC rating as of April this year had to be a minimum of an E. And it's expected that it's going to basically you, you'll have to get your building to a C rating by 2027 and to a B rating by 2030, which sounds like a long time. When you think about the sorts of things that you'll need to do to upgrade a property that currently has an EPC rating of an E to, to a B, there's quite a lot of retrofitting that's going to be involved in that, um, looking at insulation, looking at renewable energy and all those sorts of things. So I think um, that's going to that's a real a big going to be a big driver and it's also going to be a tool that tenants are already starting to use in conversation with landlords to really try and push for what you know changes to their office environments and buildings that will make them more energy efficient because you know there's two sides of this coin the tenants also want this because the buildings that you own are that a massive part of their you know operational carbon footprint um, from the energy that they use as their offices um, so it's it's very important to people, and um, you'll see it coming more and more through in conversations um, in the coming weeks, months, and years. Thanks, Andrew. All right, some really quick questions now to a couple of colleagues. So, Stuart, a question around solar. So, what role does solar play in terms of your net zero strategy? So, quick answer if you can. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely um, um, part of part of the solution. It's part of our net zero transition investment plan. Um, we see it very much so um, more aligned to our retail assets than in our offices. Um, but yeah, definitely a big, big part of it. Great. Sophie, a different question. So question around scope three. 
and collecting data, we know scope three is, is difficult. So any any advice on how you've approached scope three, how you collect data uh, mm. to, to assess your scope three emissions? Approach it collaboratively. What we've tried to do is not just put into our procurement, actually, we just want you to set a science based target or actually we just want you to monitor your emissions. What we've done is collaborated with our supply chain. We've had conversations to understand what their challenges are and then using our memberships to the like of BBP, BPF, we understand where the market and the solutions are. So actually, when we're engaging, instead of saying just go and do this, we're saying, OK, we are understanding your challenges. We are identifying these tools. Let's work together and share the mutual benefits of doing this to help encourage that transition. Thanks, Sophie. And Ariane, there's a question around net zero audits. I'm not sure if you're able to answer. So do you undertake sort of formal net zero audits of your buildings? Um, so we don't, miss, well, we've had um, sort of like a portfolio wide um, net zero carbon, um, or like that was mostly a desktop um, exercise that we, we did last year but um you know because because you know we have to do this in order to be able to publish verified um data points uh, as part of our climate commitment with the bbp but i'd say that audits are a very useful tool but i think you get to a point where you know your portfolio especially if you work very closely with uh, your facilities management team um and it's all about now doing it and uh, getting your investment committee on board with investing where um, there needs to be investment to upgrade your buildings uh, but it is an essential first step i would say yes so definitely um, have a look at um, doing that zero carbon audits for a sample of your portfolio i would say there's no need to do it on every single building that would cost a lot of money as well um, and just you know extrapolate those results to see what needs to be done um, on a portfolio level is, is an extremely um, useful step. Great, thank you. So we're almost out of time. So I'm going to take chair's privilege and ask the final question. Um, sort of short answers, please. We've only got two minutes, but maybe we can go around the screen. So the final question that I'm keen to ask is actually, if there's, if there's one piece of advice that, that you would give to a business that's just starting out on its net zero journey, you know, thinking about setting targets and plans, what would that be, Andrew? Um, so I think it's it's getting to grips with at the corporate level and at your asset level. What, where are you? Where do you want to get to? And how are you going to get there? Fundamentally, and so you know, with with Planet Mark members, we help them with uh, you know measuring both the corporate emissions and sort of reducing that year on year, but then also looking at development projects and looking at new builds, looking at retrofitting and certifying them for saying, this is how much carbon you've reduced in the construction of this, but also looking at the ongoing operational emissions and the continual reductions, which once we have the net zero standard, you know, organizations will be able to sort of accredit against. Um, so yeah, get your house in order <laughs> and it will benefit you in the longer run for sure. And in the short term, because, you know, the cheapest unit of energy is the one that you don't use. Thanks, Andrew. Adam? I would say um, clarity on the value proposition of net zero for your business, because if you're a sustainability manager or professional at the start of your journey, you've got to convince your board, your senior managers and investment decision makers on the changes that need to be made to your business. And it's much easier to do that if you've got a clear and compelling message for what it's going to cost and what the benefits will be to your business. Great. Thanks, Adam. Ariane? Yeah, I would echo what Adam was saying. I think there's a huge well um, engagement uh, exercise to be done with with senior management, but also like a wider education piece with all the um, stakeholders in your company. So not only those that are like the most obvious. I keep I keep referring to facilities managers, but also just everyone else in the company because um, probably ninety five percent of the people in your business business can help uh, one way or another to reach those net zero carbon targets. So if you've got um, what, we did an internal training program on, on net zero and wider sustainability issues. And I think that's always a little bit useful to, you know, let people know what they can do and just um, raise awareness as well. Thanks, Ariane. Sophie? 
Yeah, it echoes, but communicate your why really carefully. This is no longer just about climate science. This is about regulations, ability to deliver what your company does. It's about the reputation and it's even growing in the financial space, the benefits that you can gain from doing this. So communicate that why to gain your buy-in within that business. And secondly, just because I'm conscious we've covered lots and lots, don't be afraid to just get started. We've mentioned lots of different things, but take an assessment, work out which are the ones that are going to be most material, the best for your business and just don't be afraid to take that first step fantastic thanks sophie and stuart the final word to you yeah i agree with everything that's been said um but really about making it relevant um to people that need to take those actions um making it engaging um collaborating but also um introducing competition as well that's something that we've found through our customer engagement program as well um looking at reducing league tables and it, it really kind of helps to drive that engagement and collaboration to um, to drive improvements. Great. Thank you, Stuart. And, and thank you all. And thank you for dialing in. We're slightly over time, but I hope you found this useful. We'll be publishing uh, a recording of this on uh, on BPF channels as well. So watch out for that. But I hope you found the session useful. Thank you again to our panel for, for a great conversation and have a good afternoon, everybody. Mm -hmm.